Think Forward. Think Research Channel. So now it gives me uh, great pleasure to introduce our inaugural speaker of the 2006-2007 uh, Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. It's uh, uh, Dr. Joe Berger, uh, who is uh, the professor and chairman of the Department of Neurology at the University of Kentucky uh, College of Medicine. He is well known to almost all of you, but for those of you who don't uh, uh, keep track with his research interests, they're quite broad, and in my mind and many others are really the paradigm of clinical and translational science here, uh, and it's quite fitting that uh, he is going to speak about uh, his work with AIDS and AIDS effective uh, neurological system. Joe? Thank you very much. It's quite an honor to be the inaugural speaker uh, in this series. Uh, the illness I'm going to speak about is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. My wife would joke that I was a world's authority on a disease nobody ever heard of until February of 2005 when it was realized that a drug that had been recently introduced for the treatment of multiple sclerosis was associated with this very rare disease. Uh, the way I became an authority on this disease is uh, somewhat interesting. I actually started life as an internist, not as a neurologist. And before I moved here nearly 12 years ago, I would attend not only on the neurology service, but also on the medical service at the University of Miami, Jackson Memorial Hospital, a very large public health trust hospital in which there were lots of AIDS patients, and I sort of fell into the neurologic complications of AIDS is my area of research interest. And uh, after killing rats with Myron Ginsburg for a while and realized that this was a calling that um, I really enjoyed. One of the illnesses which was seen in people with HIV was progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So what I want to tell you today is about this illness and uh, my and my colleagues' contributions to it. So we will go through a number of Things so that you better understand the illness. We'll talk a little bit about the history. We'll talk about the virus that causes it and how the disease evolves, illnesses that predispose to it, the epidemiology, its clinical manifestations, neuroimaging and pathology, how one establishes the diagnosis, how the drug that was introduced for multiple sclerosis caused this illness, or at least what the best theories are. And we'll talk about prognosis and treatment, and I'll interweave my own contributions. This was an illness that was first crystallized as an entity in 1958 by three investigators up at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Astro, Mancall, and Richardson. They gave it its name, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, because it was a white matter disease that was progressive and affected different areas of the brain. And they described it in three individuals, all of whom had underlying lymphoproliferative disorders, two with leukemia, one with Hodgkin's disease, and all dead within six months' time. So it was a rapidly fatal illness. Now, like good investigators, they said, has anybody ever described this illness before? And they did find descriptions of it, but nobody really ever put it together quite the way they did and identified the three characteristic histopathological features of the illness, which we'll comment on in a second. It was first described, apparently, in 1930 by Julius Halivorden, whose name uh, currently is being expunged from the medical literature because he happened to be a Nazi scientist, and used the brains of victims of the concentration camps and the psychiatry patients and children that were killed by the Nazis in his investigations. Now, he was a collector, and he would collect things, and if he didn't have enough of them, he put it together in this monograph entitled Unique and Non-Classifiable Processes. And by the way, many neurologists are collectors. It's just the nature of the beast. In the monograph, he said something very interesting. And uh, I owe this observation uh, to my colleague, Sid Huff, who I'll refer to here uh, not infrequently. Sid's recently joined the Department of Neurology here. He was formerly at the NIH and then at Georgetown and Loyola. Uh, but he's made some of the seminal contributions to our understanding of this disease as well. 
Um, and what Hallivorden said was, for lack of an analogy to known diseases, these unusual illnesses disappear in the archives and are consigned to oblivion as worthless curiosities, yet it is often the unusual case which uncovers new relationships and give rise to new lines of inquiry. Well, nowhere has that been more true than with progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is the first virally induced demyelinating disease of the brain. So it's due to a virus, however, when first described, it wasn't apparent what this was due to. It was thought perhaps perineoplastic in process, an autoimmune disorder, toxic, maybe infectious. But the following year, because inclusion bodies were seen in the nuclei of oligodendrocytes, the thought was that maybe there was a virus underlying it. And in 1965, Gabrielle Zurein at the University of Wisconsin in Madison Looking at the morphology of these crystal structures, by electron microscopy said, you know, they look like polyomaviruses. Polyomaviruses are the same sorts of viruses that cause warts. And when she presented this at an American Society of Virology meeting, she was met with a great deal of skepticism, particularly expressed by Dr. Albert Sabin, the uh, polio vaccine, oral polio vaccine inventor. But she was right, and that was proven by her colleague, Billy Paget. The virus was cultured from an individual in human fetal glial cell lines. Uh, and the virus became known as the JC virus because that was the initial of the individual from whom the virus was isolated. This is what the virus looks like. It's a 40 nanometer non-envelope double-stranded DNA icosahedral virus. We know its entire uh, genomic structure. It has uh, various regions, an early region of the genome, a late region, which codes for structural proteins chiefly. There are three structural proteins. There are three regulatory proteins. And then there's this regulatory region of the genome, a promoter enhancer region, which I want to draw your attention to because it's quite important in the pathogenesis of this illness. It appears that JC virus, despite what you may read in older literature, is responsible for all progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. There are a few reports of BK virus and of SV40. These are also Popova viruses causing it, but apparently uh, that has not been substantiated. If you give this virus to an animal, it does not cause demyelinating disease, interestingly enough. There is no, unfortunately, animal model, and it's one of the things that we are contemplating developing, but right now there's no animal model for this disease. If you give it to primates or you give it to hamsters, what happens is they develop astroglial tumors, neurectodermal tumors, and in fact, um, the genome has been found in human tumors, not just CNS tumors, but tumors elsewhere. Not frequently, but with variable frequencies in gut tumors and other tumors by um, several groups, particularly Kamel Khalili's group in Philadelphia. And what one often sees is this T antigen so it is believed that, like in animals, this virus has oncogenic potential in human beings as well. The best evidence is, is that however you become infected, this virus becomes latent in reticular endothelial tissues, lymphoid tissue. We find it in kidneys. We find it in spleen and in bone marrow. It's found in lung. It's certainly found in tonsils. What we do know, and I'll show you this, is that the virus that is found in bone marrow and the virus that is found in spleen shares a promoter enhancer region that um, makes it neurotropic. And there's a reason for that that I, I will explain to you. However, the virus that's found in the kidney has deletions in its promoter enhancer region and is not a neurotropic virus. Whether it can mutate into a neurotropic virus at some point in time is not really known. And there are a lot of unanswered questions, which I'll show you at the end of this talk, some of which we intend to pursue here. What is known so far is, like other viruses, this virus does have, it does require a cell surface receptor. There are probably several that it uses. One recently identified has been a serotonin receptor, a 5-HT2A receptor. So it will bind there. It then enters the cell through clathrin-dependent endocytosis. These um, activities could be blocked by various drugs, by the way. Uh, and then it gets transported by the caviosome into the endoplasmic reticulum. 
and from there into the nucleus. Now, it turns out that if you look at individuals, and this uh, comes from studies that I've, that, that I've been involved in with collaborators at the NIH, as well as here at the University of Kentucky, if you look at individuals that have progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, this rare brain illness, over 90% of them will have JC virus percolating through their, their body, in their blood, in their B lymphocytes. If you look at individuals that are perfectly normal, interestingly enough, somewhere, be, somewhere on the order of 2% to 2% will have B lymphocytes that contain JC virus uh, in their blood. And I liken this to the individual that's been infected with, say, a herpes virus, herpes simplex virus. You've been infected with herpes simplex, it goes into a latent or quiescent state, it doesn't cause any problems, and periodically it gets re-expressed. You may be shedding the virus from your mouth, you may not even have a cold sore, or you may have a cold sore with it, and then it goes away. And this is what appears to be the case with JC virus as well. Uh, we do find that in about 50 percent, 40 to 50 percent of AIDS patients who are immunologically suppressed, that is before the era of highly active antiretroviral therapy, one in two of them had this virus circulating in their blood. Uh, however, if they're well-controlled HIV-infected people, uh, it's about the same as what we see in the otherwise uh, immunologically normal individual. So right now, this is the party line. Uh, let me just put all this up. This is the party line. And you know what? Some of what I tell you may be disproven in the future. I'm just going to tell you what our theories are right now, and they're based on, on pretty good evidence, but uh, no, it's not completely known. So we think that you're probably infected oropharyngeally or a respiratory infection that the virus then um, enters the tonsils. It'll infect stromal cells in the tonsils and tonsillar lymphocytes. The virus then um, percolates through the body. It will then enter a latent state in bone marrow and in kidney. The virus that we find in kidney is different than that in the bone marrow. And one of the questions we have is, if you're infected with what's referred to as the archetype virus, the one that's shed in the urine, well, that, is that sufficient to give you that uh, persistent antibody state? But perhaps it'll never mutate into a form that's neurotropic. Perhaps you have to be infected with a neurotropic strain in order to subsequently develop PML. So not everybody that has the antibody may necessarily be at risk for the development of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. The virus then will percolate through the blood periodically, get re-expressed. It's present in B lymphocytes. We do polymerase chain reaction on peripheral blood mononuclear cells for that reason. It's not easily detected in plasma, but it is a cell-associated virus. The virus, by the way, is also sticky. So while it will productively infect B lymphocytes, and Sid Huff, by the way, was the person who first demonstrated that, um, while it will productively infect these B lymphocytes, it will stick to the surfaces of polys and will stick to the surfaces of T lymphocytes, so you may find it there as well. It then will uh, disseminate into the brain. It's got to enter the brain. We think it enters the brain as a cell-associated virus. We're not certain. And it will productively infect oligodendrocytes, leading to the demyelination. These cells will die by necrosis, and you will be left with demyelination. So the, a number of things has to occur. The development of PML is a stochastic event. I mean, think of this. 80 to 90 percent of us have been infected by this virus. But normal people don't develop this disease. It is an exceptionally rare disease. Uh, you have to be immunosuppressed. And in fact, you have to have certain forms of immunosuppression to develop it. And we'll talk about that. So this is really a chance event. You have to be infected. Presumably, you have to be infected, or perhaps you have to be infected with a neurotropic strain. In fact, if you're infected with an archetype strain, maybe you're protected from the future development of PML. The virus then has to establish latency. We think it becomes latent in everybody, but we don't know that that is indeed the case. And that's one of the things we've proposed to do. And I, Joe Pulliam, who I see in the audience, is somebody who will be collaborating with us, hopefully, in a, with it in an NIH grant that we recently submitted, in which that's one of the questions that's being addressed. Um, the virus then has to undergo gene rearrangements if it's not a neurotropic strain of the virus. Uh, it then has to get re-expressed, and we think that 
a failure of normal immunity in some way um, uh, uh, facilitates that re-expression. Once it's re-expressed, it then has to enter the brain. That may not be quite as easy as, as it's thought to be. And it has to productively infect oligodendrocytes. And we know from our AIDS data that individuals that have this disease, although it had, recent, it had been previously thought to be an illness that was uh, universally fatal, that people can recover from this illness. They can actually remyelinate their brains, which is interesting. And they can clear this virus from their brain with a restoration of their immune system. There is an active immunosurveillance of the brain that can sweep this virus out, and that may occur before the development of clinically recognized disease. So what are the predisposing illnesses? Now, I want to bring your attention to something. In 1984, Ben Brooks and Deward Walker, then at the University of Wisconsin, which was the hotbed of PML investigation, were able to collect 230 cases from the world's literature and from their own experience. 230 cases from 1958 to 1984. I'm going to come back to this in a second because I'll show you what my experience was before moving to Kentucky. Two-thirds of the individuals had underlying lymphoproliferative diseases, just like those initial cases, CLL and lymphoma chiefly. Six percent had underlying myeloproliferative diseases, two percent had carcinoma, 16 percent had immunodeficiency states. That wasn't all AIDS. In fact, in 1984, there were only five cases of AIDS with PML. One of them was my patient. Three of them were reported in a series from New York, and one uh, other came from Columbia. Um, so immune deficiency states were, uh, as a cause, really were other immune deficiency states, not HIV. 7% had granulomatous and inflammatory disorders like TB and sarcoidosis. And in 5%, there was no recognized underlying cause. AIDS changed all that, and it's sort of how I fell into this because that was my, that's been one of my chief interests, has been the neurologic complications of HIV. In 1991, uh, looking at the San Francisco Bay Area, people in the Bay Area who had AIDS, 0.3% of them were also diagnosed with PML. In 1991, looking at CDC uh, death certificates, they found that just under 1% of all the patients dying with AIDS had PML on that death certificate. Now, in my opinion, that's probably not the very best way to assess how frequently one sees a disease. People with AIDS frequently die with many diseases. Not all of them are recorded, and in fact, not all of them are recognized. In 1987, we looked at all the patients admitted to Jackson Memorial Hospital, big public health trust hospital uh, connected with the University of Miami. And just under 4% of all the individuals that were in the hospital with AIDS also had PML. That was an astronomical number in light of what had been previously reported. And when we reported that in the Annals of Internal Medicine, um, there was some degree of skepticism on the part of people that read it. However, we felt vindicated a few years later when in an autopsy series, the same thing was reported. Now, the problem with hospitalized patients in autopsy series is that they're both skewed. I mean, why, after all, are people in the hospital? Why, after all, do people come to autopsy? They have something interesting. So uh, the very best data that I'm familiar with comes from three medical examiners in Broward County, Larry uh, Tate, Michael Bell, and George Hensley, who were all University of Miami professors. There were also the medical examiners in Broward County, and there's a law in Florida that says if you die with a disease that the medical examiner thinks poses a risk to the population at large, they can autopsy you. It doesn't matter what your religion is, what your family wants, they can do an autopsy. Now, most medical examiners would like to keep the AIDS patient uh, at arm's distance, so they would simply say an autopsy is unnecessary. Anybody that ended up in the medical examiner's office who was serologically positive for HIV got autopsied in Broward County. And what they found in 548 unselected autopsies is that one in 20 people dying with AIDS at that time, and this, by the way, is before the highly active antiretroviral therapy era, one in 20 of them had neuropathologically confirmed PML. This is astronomical. Um, it turns out that by 1993, almost 90% of all the individuals in this nation who had PML 
had HIV as their underlying cause. How frequent is this disease now? Well, in 1987, it was as common as myasthenia gravis and Huntington's disease. In 1991, as common as polymyositis and had half the incidence of Guillain-Barre and motor neuron disease by 1995. It's tailed off now with better treatment of AIDS, but we still see it uh, with some frequency. And there's something very interesting, which is um, that AIDS uniquely predisposes the, you to this illness. And why that happens is something that has been an interest of mine. So let me try to explain this to you. In the United States right now, it's estimated that there are roughly 1.2 million people with HIV infection. So these people are at risk for developing the disease. But look at the number of people with malignancies in the United States annually. Look at the number of people with rheumatoid arthritis that are on immunosuppressive regimens. Look at the number of organ transplants, bone marrow transplants, and I haven't put in there those with sarcoid, those with TB. All these other Ill illnesses that are known to be predisposing illnesses. The denominator there is enormous, and the way I've tried to represent it is this way. Everybody outside the circle are you and me, ostensibly. That is otherwise normal individuals, no immunosuppression. In the circle are those people that are at risk for uh, reasons of being immunosuppressed. And this circle here, the pink circle, is the HIV pool of individuals. Now, 80 to 90 percent of all of us have been infected with this virus. I couldn't make the dot small enough to represent the normal population right now because right now they represent less than 1 percent of the total pool. It's that small. But th it's enormous, the potential number of people, yet we see very little PML in otherwise immunologically healthy people. In the non-HIV pool, it's 10 to 20 percent of cases, and this is what it looks like in the HIV pool. Between 1980 and 1994, I collected cases at the University of Miami of patients with PML. And this is what we found. In 1981, we didn't see any. In 82, we didn't see any. We started seeing it in 1983. Remember that AIDS was described in 1981. We actually saw cases before 1981. We weren't sure what it was. Um, it tended to plateau in the early 1990s, and what we saw was a 20-fold increase between 81 and 84 and 91 and 94. 156 cases of PML. I told you between 1958 and 1984, surveying the world's literature, they came up with about 230 cases. Here are 156 personally evaluated cases of PML in this period of time. Only two of which were not HIV related. One had lymphoma, one had Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. We happened to report him because it had never previously been reported. In the past, this was a disease of older people. Men equaled women. Uh, currently, this is a disease of men between the ages of 20 and 50 because it parallels, um, largely parallels the demographics of HIV. And as those d demographics change, I'm sure this will change as well. Used to be thought that you had to be profoundly immunosuppressed. What we saw in our own um, experience is that you did not need to be, that over 10 percent of individuals had CD4 counts that exceeded 200. One of my patients had a CD4 count of 793. I'll tell you more about him in a second. This is uh, from Brooks and Walker's series, what they found in terms of symptoms and signs. From my series, it was a little different, and I do think that the HIV-infected patient presents somewhat differently. Visual deficits were the commonest abnormality they saw. Do, this, by the way, is due to brain disease, not due to eye or optic nerve disease, uh, like in um, multiple sclerosis. Cognitive abnormalities were seen in a third. Uh, motor deficits were seen in 20 percent, in coordination in, whoops, in 10 percent. This comes from that series of 154 AIDS-related PML patients. So this was my series in Miami. Uh, weakness was the commonest symptom, followed by cognitive impairments, speech abnormalities, headache, gait impairment, visual abnormalities. The commonest sign was hemiparesis, followed by gait disturbance, cognitive impairment, dysarthria, dysphagia, hemisensory loss. They did develop visual field deficits. That it just wasn't as common. However, this was one of the patients. This, by the way, is a Kentucky patient who had cortical blindness. 
This man, by the way, not only had cortical blindness, he had something called Anton syndrome, which is a denial of blindness. You know, many people that are cortically blind will tell you, I just don't see anything, but there's a small number who uh, have a denial of illness associated with it, you know, and they'll describe things that they're really not seeing. Uh, and not surprisingly, this is where his lesions were, precisely where you'd expect them to be in somebody with cortical blindness and Anton syndrome. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll show you her as well. This is a very interesting patient who I saw down in Miami. She was said to be the longest living survivor of HIV infection. She was said to be congenitally infected. She was 13 years old when I first saw her. She was actually reported in Lancet as the longest living congenitally infected individual. However, in speaking with her mother, it became apparent to me that um, it wasn't clear that she was necessarily congenitally infected for a variety of reasons. But uh, in any event, she came to see me um, because she had quit talking. And she not only quit talking, uh, she found it difficult to eat. She had this funny um, expression on her face. She drooled all the time. She was very slow in her movements. Um, she had some problems with balance. She had an illness that was sort of sort of symmetrically represented, you know, both sides were equally affected. Um, this was her CT scan and her MRI, and it showed these symmetric lesions. If one looks, though, one can see a few little ditzels here, here, and here. I mean, sort of nonspecific, and we see funny things in people that are HIV infected. Now, every Tuesday morning, I would review films with Judy Post. Some of you may know Judy Post. She's probably the best neuroradiologist in the world when it comes to infectious diseases of the central nervous system. Judy Post is a graduate of the University of Kentucky and is one of our distinguished alums. She lives down in uh, Miami. She's on the faculty there. And her husband is the fellow who bought the castle out on Versailles Road. Uh, but in any event, so I'm showing Judy the, the films. And I said, Judy, what do you think this is? She says, I have no idea. It doesn't look like toxo. It doesn't look like lymphoma. I have no idea what this is and it turned out to be PML. So sometimes it can present in funny ways. Now we did a study at the University of Kentucky, uh, the University of Miami rather, uh, with Michelle Whiteman and Judy and George Hensley where we attempted to correlate the radiographic findings with what we saw pathologically and clinically. And the radiographic findings are the following. The, on CT scan, these are hypodense lesions. There's rare contrast enhancement, about 10%, just a little under. And, and in the past, that, never thought, that was thought not to be the case. But we demonstrated that you can see contrast enhancement. You have an increased signal on T2-weighted image and flare. There's typically no mass effect unless the, uh, the immune system's restored, uh, in which case you may see mass effect and florid contrast enhancement. The lesions are frontal and parieto-occipital, but they may occur in funny locations, always in the white matter, though, uh, almost always. The, it affects the white matter, even white matter within the cortex. So uh, pathologically, you may see things there, but uh, radiographically, one doesn't. And you'll see rare, faint gadolinium enhancement. These are all pathologically confirmed cases. In fact, these are all autopsy patients that were in our series. So this is the CT scan. This is the MRI of that patient. These are just two different MRI images of the same patient. And you see multifocal lesions affecting the white matter generally subcortically present. And the symptoms that one develops are the symptoms that represent, that, that reflect the area that's involved. I told you that there was a man that had a CD4 count of 793 when we first uh, uh, tested him, which is a bit unusual that the, the, you know, their, their immune system is that healthy. This was that man, his name was Ron Wiebeck. I don't mind using it because he's been on the cover of People and Parade magazine as well as East West. But I thought this was the best picture as a long-term AIDS survivor. Uh, this, of course, was back in 1991, so it's an old. Uh, this was his CT scan. There was an area of contrast enhancement. This man was a waiter on Cape Cod, and he knew there was something wrong with him when he started thanking his left hand for helping him clear the table. He said, damn, what's that all about? So he went over to the Massachusetts General Hospital where he was first diagnosed with HIV. He didn't know he was HIV infected. Uh, and they thought this was toxoplasma because, after all, mass lesion, contrast-enhancing lesion, they'd think, well, that's got to be toxo with AIDS. He didn't get any better. It got worse. In fact, um, he ultimately was biopsied, 
And the person who read the biopsy was E.P. Richardson, Jr. That's the same person who first described the histopathology of PML. And he was diagnosed with PML and sent home to die. Home was St. Petersburg, so his family would bring him down to me periodically to see him. He weighed 90 pounds when I first saw him. He was hemiplegic and had a hemisensory deficit. Then he started to improve. He was on one drug, Dilantin. He was put on Dilantin because the neurosurgeon who operated on him thought he might have a seizure at some time. He had never had seizures. I left him on Dilantin. He got better and better and better and better. Now, he had two features that we subsequently demonstrated are uh, good prognostic signs in this disease. One is the contrast enhancement. The other was the very high CD4 count. And uh, he got better so that at uh, after a couple of years, all he had was the inability to tap his left foot quickly, and uh, he said, should I go back to work? I said, yes, you can go back to work. And he actually did quite well until I got a call from one of the magazines that said, um, Ron has given us permission to talk to you about him. We understand he doesn't have HIV any longer. And I said, no, no, uh, he's still HIV infected as best I know. It's the JC virus that he's cleared. When he heard at the NIH that he didn't have the virus anymore, he heard what he wanted to hear, that he didn't have HIV, he still had JCV. Talk about psychoneuroimmunology. Within a month of that time, he was sick again. He had tuberculous pericarditis, which cleared with treatment. And uh, about a year and a half afterwards, he died with lymphoma but he never had a recurrence of PML. This is very, very interesting. This is another patient of mine. I show you this because of the beautiful correlation between what one sees radiographically and what one sees pathologically. This young man came in with an aphasia. He was in his early teens. He had had three liver transplants done by Thomas Starzl in Pittsburgh, acquired HIV at that time and uh, ultimately develop PML. We do not see PML very frequently in children, and in, I, uh, I've probably written more about it than anybody because I had the largest collection of children with this disease. And the reason we don't see it in children is very simple. Children are pristine with respect to JC virus. I showed you the serologic data. What that shows is between the ages of 0 and 20 is when you acquire this infection. So that if you're five years old or eight years old, the likelihood of having this virus is much less than when you're 30 or 40 years old. Now, most of the time, we can make this diagnosis on the basis of other parameters. But um, some people have used magnetic resonance spectroscopy, showing high levels of lactate and lipid, lower levels of NAA, in an effort to help establish the diagnosis radiographically. What one sees pathologically is a combination of actually a triad histopathologically of demyelination, bizarre astrocytes, which are generally non-productively infected, and enlarged oligodendroglial nuclei, and the oligodendrocyte is productively infected. You get this moth-eaten appearance, often subcortically. This is an h and &E Luxol fast blue stain. This should all be blue. This should all be myelin, but the myelin's missing because the oligos, which make the myelin, have all died off. The lesions can look very much like MS lesions, and this is of some concern because um, if we are going to give drugs, which I'll talk about in a second, that can predispose to this illness, how are you going to distinguish it early on from MS lesions? And these are the lesions that one sees. You can also see lesions that are s small and subcortical and also within the cortex. Uh, and they often cause these puffballs of demyelination that occur perivenularly, a bit like multiple sclerosis, you know, and there's this uh, long-standing theory that multiple sclerosis is really just a viral illness. We haven't found the virus yet. Uh, personally, I think that MS is probably a spectrum of disorders, but I do think that there probably is a viral underpinning or an infectious underpinning to some of it. The axons are generally preserved, but occasionally these lesions may be necrotic, and the astrocytes can look remarkably malignant with these uh, incredible mitotic figures in them. In fact, that led to a misdiagnosis in one of the cases reported in the New England Journal that I'll refer to. They thought the person had a glioma. When they went back and looked, and tur it turned out that they had PML. The oligos have a very characteristic appearance. It's described as a fried egg appearance. These nuclei are chock full of, uh, of virus, 
and the, the cells die by necrosis. There's generally very little in the way of inflammation. So this is a viral illness of the brain, but it doesn't look like a typical encephalitis where you see a lot of uh, inflammatory infiltrate perivascularly. On occasion, we'll see it, but not very often. You can demonstrate the virus by um, in situ histochemistry, and you can do it with biotinylated stains or fluorescein stains, and you can demonstrate it by electron microscopy. Now, establishing the diagnosis, in my mind, the gold standard still remains the brain biopsy, where you find the classic triad histopathologically, and you uh, also demonstrate that the virus is there by um, uh, immune techniques or by electron microscopy. However, in the absence of doing a biopsy, provided you have the appropriate clinical picture and radiographic picture, and combine it with the presence of JC virus by PCR in the spinal fluid, that should be sufficient to make the diagnosis because this is a highly specific test. It is not 100% sensitive. It's only about 70 to 80% sensitive. And it's uh, very apparent on, uh, it, it's apparent to me that uh, it's very laboratory specific. I've yet to see one, and I staff a neuroaids clinic at Vanderbilt. I've yet to see a positive test uh, on a patient um, in that setting that from down there. And yet when I, we bring them up here for their brain biopsies, we have been seeing them. So I think that there's laboratory, there are differences in the laboratories. Uh, what is it that explains, and this is something that has interested me for a long time, I'll show you. Uh, this I've written about um, um, fairly extensively, and that is there's something unique about HIV as I attempt to show you earlier. What is it about HIV that increases one's the predisposition to develop progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy? Well, there, there are probably a number of things. It's probably not one factor. Uh, to, to begin with, there's likely, a well, we know there's a degree, a difference in the degree and duration of cellular immunosuppression. We also know from studies done here, and these were studies that were done with, uh, with Cal Avison and the group in the MRI Science Center, that we know that individuals that are HIV infected very early on will have a disruption of their blood-brain barrier, even before they develop any symptomatology. We know this virus gets into the brain very early. Within two weeks of infection, HIV is in the brain. So you can demonstrate this disruption of the blood-brain barrier. You can also demonstrate an upregulation of adhesion molecules on vascular endothelium that would increase one's likelihood of getting a cell-associated virus into the brain. And it's been demonstrated by others that this virus, JC virus, can be transactivated by the TAT protein of HIV. And this was, some of this work uh, is uh, uh, work done in collaboration with Avi Nath, who used to be in the department here, largely done, though, in Kamel Khalili's laboratory at Temple University. And that cytokines and chemokines that are generated by the multinucleated giant cells uh, that are HIV infected in the brain will also transactivate JC virus. So here are these multinucleated giant cells. They elaborate these chemokines that will upregulate the uh, vascular uh, um, uh, adhesion molecules, permitting B lymphocytes, which would ordinarily not traffic into the brain, to get into the brain, some of which may be infected with a neurotropic strain. They then infect the oligodendrocytes and astrocytes and the chemokines and uh, TAT proteins, certain, certain of the chemokines, will um, transactivate the JC virus. So there's probably multiple reasons why we see so much PML in the setting of HIV. What about natalizumab? This is where everything got interesting because there was this very exciting drug uh, that's just come back to market called natalizumab. It's an alpha-4 integrin inhibitor. There are others that are in development currently. It seems to be quite effective in the treatment of multiple sclerosis, and people were very excited about it. What the, this drug does is it binds to the VLA4 or alpha-4 beta-1 integrin site on T lymphocytes, as well as other cells exhibiting um, this alpha-4 beta-1 integrin, prevents it from adhering to VCAM, and therefore prevents the cell from entering the brain. Now, it not only binds the alpha-4 beta-1 site, but it binds alpha-4 beta-7, which is necessary for cells to get into the gut, inflammatory cells to get into the gut, and therefore it's been used as well 
in inflammatory bowel disorders, but it does not have the same efficacy in those disorders as it appears to have in multiple sclerosis. Uh, we know that a number of cells will express this alpha-4, beta-1, including lymphocytes, monocytes, basophils, and eosinophils, uh, and these are prevented from entering the brain to varying degrees. Not only does it prevent migration of leukocytes by preventing adhesion, but there also appears to be a decrease in cell activation, in proliferation, and in apoptosis of leukocytes, all of which may be salutary in the setting of multiple sclerosis. So what do we know? We know that 80 percent of T cells are prevented from entering the brain when you give this drug. We know that one month after administration, 80 percent of the sites on the lymphocytes are still bound by the natalizumab. So it's still around, even though its half-life is only 11 days plus or minus five, that is finding the free drug in the blood. It, the lymphocytes still have this bound and it's still having an effect because three months after administration, you still have a decrease in the gadolinium enhancement that occurs in active MS lesions. And we know that six months after its administration, a single administration, that you have a decrease in the number of inflammatory cells in the spinal fluid as compared to pretreatment levels. So this is a drug that has a long biological activity even after given once. Now, where it became interesting and where you know, the, the phone started ringing off the hook, as my wife says, uh, and it wasn't just the biomedical industry that was calling me, it was Wall Street, which I found very amusing because they all want to know, you know, what's going to happen next? Well, there were three cases, two of which had multiple sclerosis, one of which had Crohn's disease that developed PML following the use of this drug. Interestingly enough, other opportunistic infections did not appear to be increased in this group. Now, the numbers of people that have been treated are relatively small. When you look at the hard data, there does appear to be a likelihood that there we'll see other opportunistic infections. For instance, cryptosporidia uh, gastroenteritis was seen in one of the patients. Well, we seldom see that in otherwise immunologically normal people. Herpes simplex encephalitis and multiple sclerosis, which I've never seen, was reported. You know, uh, so it's likely there. But there was something unique about the association with progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And then uh, Igor Koralnik and I wrote the editorial that accompanied the, the uh, New England Journal papers. What was found was three patients. Two of them were in a trial of Tysabri and Avonex. Avonex is a beta interferon given intramuscularly once a week for multiple sclerosis. That was two of 600 patients that had been treated for greater than two years and it was seen in one patient with Crohn's disease who was in a trial called the INACT trial. That was one of 248 patients. Now, there's something very interesting. That is, is that I, I give this talk or some permutation of it a lot all over. MS doctors, I, I speak at the MS consortium. I've spoken at the European meeting of MS physicians. And I always ask, have you ever seen PML with MS? To all the MS gurus, nobody's ever seen it. It's not been reported until this. Now that's interesting because patients that have advanced multiple sclerosis, what do we do to them? We put them on cyclophosphamide, we put them on Imuran, we put them on high doses of prednisone, we put them on a lot of immunosuppressive drugs and you would think that, you know, if 90 percent of us are infected with this virus, well, somebody's going to develop PML. Nobody's ever seen this before. And Igor Koralnik went back and looked at JC virus specific cytotoxic T lymphocyte response in MS patients. And what he found is it's very high, higher than the normal population. So the thought is, is that MS patients may be naturally protected against developing PML, which is very interesting. Uh, there's something else that you need to know, and that is, is that this patient, these patients, two of them were treated with beta interferon, and the thought was, well, maybe beta interferon contributed in some way. But nobody has ever been reported to have PML with beta interferon therapy. And in fact, beta interferon is an antiviral. One would expect them to be protected in some way. Uh, quite frankly, I don't think the beta interferon uh, was associated in any way. And I would tell you that we recently obtained funding um, to look at MS patients for JC virus. And one of the things we're going to do is look at individuals who are naive, who are started on beta interferon, and see whether the beta interferon in some way alters the expression of JC virus in their peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So roughly the incidence is one in a thousand, at least that's what it is currently. 
Um, actually, one I wanted to show you was this. This was the Crohn's patient. The Crohn's patient had plasma collected at roughly every three months intervals. And that Crohn's patient, um, when the natalizumab was restarted after an eight-month hiatus, and natalizumab alone, what you saw was JC virus gradually increasing in their blood to the point right before they became clinically symptomatic, it was very high. So, or the, the point they became clinically symptomatic was very high. Now, plasma, as I told you earlier, is not where you look for JC virus. It's very hard to find it there. Uh, and I would argue that had they looked at peripheral blood mononuclear cells, they would have seen much higher concentrations. They may have even seen it back here when he was treated with natalizumab. But the argument to be made is this fits very nicely with the theory that we have that the virus is latent or quiescent in, in lymphoproliferative tissues, that, that it gets re-expressed periodically, and it must be re-expressed before it enters the brain and protect and and um, and um, uh, actively infects uh, oligodendrocytes. That it is not a virus, at least the best evidence is, although there's literature to the contrary, the best evidence is it is not a virus that is latent in the brain. So what's unique about natalizumab? These are the things that we propose. This is, these are the things that we intend to study. Um, one is we know that natalizumab will, and drugs like it, will decrease surveillance both in the periphery and in the brain. And it's likely that it's, it, the impairment of immunosurveillance in the brain was the most important factor because we know that when we restore the immune system in HIV-infected people, they can develop a disease called, or an entity called the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome where they can clear this virus. I've shown you a couple of those patients. I showed you Ron Wiebeck. There are other patients. In fact, nowadays, 50% of the individuals that are started on highly active antiretroviral therapy, provided they were naive before, if they have PML, 50% survive the illness. But they may develop a very active immune response with, these, with new lesions appearing, with contrast enhancement appearing, um, and uh, with uh, new symptomatology appearing before they get better. And in fact, they may die during the course of that immune response. So that's probably a large part of it, the, the absence of the scavenging. But the other thing that you need to know is our theory is that the virus is latent in B lymphocytes, in the spleen and in the bone marrow, and periodically gets re-expressed. Now, it turns out in order for the B lymphocytes, particularly immature B lymphocytes, but others as well, in order for them to remain uh, let's see if I have a slide of that. There you go. In order for them to remain in these sites, they need alpha-4 integrin. They home to the alpha-4 integrin. If you block the alpha-4 integrin, as natalizumab does, what happens is these lymphocytes are expressed from these tissues. So if these lymphocytes have the virus in them and they're being expressed in high numbers, there's an increased likelihood that they're going to enter the brain. And that's particularly the case if... Uh, there's an inflammatory L component in the brain as occurs in MS. Not everybody with MS has a sealed blood-brain barrier following the institution of natalizumab. So I suspect that there's an abnormality in those people that have developed PML. They, st they had active disease. Um, they weren't cured of their illness, and I suspect that that permitted the cells to enter. So one of the things we see following the use of uh, natalizumab is a lymphocytosis, and it occurs for that reason. Uh, let's see, um, skip that. So here's what I think. I think that individuals that have lymphoid malignancies, particularly those that infect B cells, have a, a higher likelihood of developing PML than those with other immunosuppressive conditions, which I've put down here. I think that there's something very unique about the AIDS population where one in 20 individuals were developing this disease. That's quite unusual. However, uh, I would argue that at one in a thousand, those receiving alpha-4 beta-1 integrin in inhibitors, and that isn't just natalizumab, it's any others that are coming into development, and there are some that are in phase two and phase three trials now, is going to be at increased risk. It's likely excessive, uh, increased for, uh, as compared to those with lymphoid malignancies, and I will argue that since PML appears to be a stochastic event, 
where you have to have all your ducks in a row in order to develop it. You have to be infected, has to go into latency, has to be in a neurotropic, it has to be a neurotropic strain or mutate into one, it's got to be re-expressed, it's got to enter the brain, can't be cleared out. All those things have to occur. I would argue that the longer you leave somebody on the, this drug or any like it, the increased likelihood you are to develop this illness. So one in a thousand is probably a minimal risk at two years, particularly in a drugs, a f uh, class of drugs that you're going to leave individuals on indefinitely. Now there's some evidence that what I've just told you is correct, and I'll tell you why that is. A number of years ago, Carolyn Britton, who's a neurologist at Columbia University and I, were comparing our notes. She had a large population in Harlem that she was following with the neurologic complications of AIDS, and she said, you know, I don't see PML with the frequency that you see PML. And why do you think that is? And we sat, put our heads together and we said, you know, look at this. Look at the survival of your patients and look at those of mine. My patients were largely, not exclusively, but largely well-educated gay men who the moment they knew they were HIV infected got on medications, changed their diets, changed their risk factors, took care of themselves, and lived a long time. They were the ones developing PML. So the longer they had their immunosuppression, the more likely they were to develop HIV, I mean PML. What happened in her population is there was no change in lifestyle. Many of them didn't go on their drugs. They were non-compliant when the drugs were prescribed, and they were dying one or two or three years later with toxo and crypto and other illnesses. So they didn't have the time to develop the PML. So I think that there's an argument to be made here that the longer one lives with, these, with this sort of drug, uh, the more increase the likelihood of developing PML. The drug, by the way, has recently been re reintroduced into the market. It comes back with a black box warning and a program that attempts to um, inform people of the risks involved. Um, and that's not that important for this talk. What I will say is this is a disease that is crummy. The average survival ship is three and a half months with this illness. And in fact, in my own series of HIV-infected individuals, the mode from time of diagnosis to time of death was one month. So here you have a drug that may last for three months or six months in terms of its biological activity and that you, you can't get it out of the system. I mean, un other than perhaps lymphophoresing the patient, how would you get it out of the system? I will say that 10% of my patients had prolonged survival. This was in the era before highly active antiretroviral therapy, and we now see that that number's increased substantially. I do have patients, as this one, who's still alive. It's a patient who was sent to me by Dr. Peter Frame in Cincinnati. This man's a postal worker. He was diagnosed in May 1996 with PML. That's not a worm in his brain. That's the biopsy that uh, Dr. Young did. Uh, and um, in August of 1996, what became available was highly active antiretroviral therapy. He was started on it. He started getting better. He went back to running a mile every day. To the best of my knowledge, he continues to do very well and continues to be gainfully employed. There are a number of things that we've demonstrated have been uh, helpful prognostically. Uh, if PML heralds HIV infection, these people tend to do better if they have enhancement, which to me suggests an inflammatory response, they do better. If they have high CD4 counts, they do better. They have gamma interferon in their spinal fluid. Thomas Weber in Germany has demonstrated that they do better. If they have this JC virus specific cytotoxic T lymphocyte response, they do better. And if they have lower declining levels of JC virus in their spinal fluid, they do better. I'll say a few words about treatment and then end. We know that um, highly active antiretroviral therapy has changed survival ship in those with HIV. It has no effect on individuals that do not have HIV as the underlying etiology. Um, there's this entity which I've already discussed, the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, which uh, uh, heralds well, provided the person survives it. This is the New England Journal article that we put together looking at cytarabine in an HIV-infected group with PML, showing the superimposition of the various therapies. However, one of the problems is, is that you can't get high enough concentrations into the brain. 
And a colleague of mine, Robert Levy, has uh, suggested using convection-enhanced delivery. Now, convection-enhanced delivery is where you put a tube in the brain and you deliver the drug into the brain in high concentration. And it percolates through the brain. It goes through these waves. Now, its distribution is only good in the hemisphere that you deliver it to. Convection-enhanced delivery, just as a historical note, was first developed by Ed Oldfield. Some of you may know Ed. He, too, is a University of Kentucky college, um, undergrad and, and College of Medicine graduate and is head of neurosurgery at the National Institute of Neurologic Disease and Stroke and is the distinguished alumni. Uh, October 6, I think, is the award banquet for him. So in any event, he did first described this. Rob and I tried it in one patient that I sent up to Northwestern, and unfortunately, the patient did not do well, and uh, that's where we are with it. Um, Alpha, uh, I suggested at one time that alpha interferon may be of benefit, and we actually did a study looking at it, and it was not a home run, so I abandoned it. But the guys at Johns Hopkins continued to use it and said, look, these people do much better with it than when they don't get it. And I was, uh, there was some egg on my face that, you know, they continued it. Well, it turned out that they were wrong. Uh, what, what happened is they didn't account for highly active antiretroviral therapy, and when they looked at their data again, taking that into account, they realized that it was a mistake and they published a retraction. A number of things have been suggested. Um, the most recent has been recombinant IL-2. I don't know whether it'll work or not. I had a very well-known musician come see me last week from South Florida, and we started him, or two weeks ago, we started him on recombinant IL-2, but the jury's out on that. There are a lot of unanswered questions. We don't know how this virus is transmitted. We don't know what the primary infection causes. We don't know if the virus is cleared in some people or whether it becomes latent in everybody. We're not even sure of all the sites of viral latency, and with Joe, we hope to address some of those things. We don't know entirely what determines viral tropism. We do know that this region of the enhancer promoter sequence, gene sequence, it appears to be quite important in determining it. We don't know how often the virus mutates. We don't know quite how it enters the brain. Is it cell associated or could the virus enter the brain all by its lonesome? Uh, we don't know how the virus is cleared. We don't know whether PML is ever a primary infection. You know, I've told you that it, it looks like it comes out of latency and causes PML. But, and the reason we think we know that is because if you do immunologic studies on people with PML, what you find is IgG to JC virus, not IgM, suggesting that they've been exposed to this virus for a while. Um, but it's conceivable that some people develop it as a primary infection, and uh, can we exploit our knowledge for th of this virus for better therapy? So lastly, what we need is uh, more money for research, and we're out there trying to get some. Thanks. I'll end with that and take whatever questions you have. <laughs>